Hey guys, today I'm actually going to do something different. I'm going to, whilst this is playing in the background, I'm going to tell you the five top reasons why poker players seem to be failing at poker. And it isn't due to lack of talent. It isn't because people aren't smart enough, very, very often at least. Um, but there are five reasons that I keep running into time and time again with my students and with people that reach out to me online that uh, really means that they're just, they're, they're, they're crumbling and they're falling at hurdles that they actually needn't fall at. And these have really drastic results, you know, like that could be the difference between you having a, a financially free life and you're not, and you're having to work a nine to five. This is a really good size, by the way, on the turn. Uh, you can have a lot of ace, x, queen, x, and nines with a club. So the first reason is confidence. Now, it seems to be something that people underestimate a lot. But if you look at the top of the poker worlds, the one thing that you'll find again and again and again is that these people, they either got egos or they got some kind of deep seated spiritual confidence. And I've experienced this myself. I've experienced when I've been taking shots, for instance, and I, I have too much of my bankroll in a tournament or there's somebody, this is the second time in a row this guy shot, by the way, uh, hence, this, uh, <laughs> hence this call I'm about to make. Um, Hence, so I've been, I've had too much of myself in the tournament and I, I've been worrying about people being better than me and I've just played not my game. I've not played my game at all. And it happens to other people a lot more in general than it happens to me. And that's lucky on my side. It's not anything special, but it, it's something that again, I sell content by the way, again and again, I run into where people get like final three tables of a tournament or they'll be taking a shot and they'll just play like absolute crap. So how do you remedy this or how do you even notice it? Well, first of all, meditation. As you're about to see in my uh, guide of meditation and mindset masterclass, great timing. Meditation is a tool. It is such a beautiful tool and if you're not meditating, you are burning money. Give it a fucking try. It's free in most places. If you wanna go next level, you can, you can buy my mindset masterclass. But if you wanna just dip your toes in the paddling pool for a few seconds, it's free. Just type guided meditation for confidence, guided meditation for anxiety, whatever it is that you want to be solving. So confidence really is the number one thing. Most people don't even realize they're lacking confidence. You can generally tell because you start playing super weird when, uh, when people are, you know, a new stake or perhaps you might start deifying your opponents meaning that you see them as more than human. You see like chips and crisps here as somebody who's just so good at poker, he's unexploitable. But the, the fact is everybody is a human and everybody is exploitable. Number two, too many tables. I've started now that I'm, uh, now that I'm grinding uh, some tournaments again, a, a little bit just to, to kind of soften my brain up for the masterclass that I'm creating. Uh, I've decided that I, when I'm playing tournaments, I'm only playing maximum four tables, sometimes two and sometimes one table. Now that is crazy considering I used to be a person that, that with 24 table cash games. Um, but for my presence of mind and how much energy I want to be directing into each table, it really, really is working well for me. I had some amazing results at the beginning of lockdown when I actually grinded some tournaments had a few six figure scores and that's just one or two tabling when everyone else was 20 table or 15 table. Now there is time and there is a place to mass multi table. You want to be able to do it when you need it, but also you want to be the kind of person that isn't gonna get bored when they're just playing one or two tables. You know, you wanna be the kind of person that can sit there and have a great time either with a friend grinding next to you or even by yourself. And it's tough, it's grueling and it makes you look at yourself. It makes you judge uh, you know, how tilted you get, how easily tilted you get, and how um, how patient you can be in certain spots. It's really, really tough on you. I like this C bet here. This um, this guy is gonna be a lot wider um, than he ought to be. So um, he's meant to have the stronger range, but I think because it's him specifically, he's gonna have a lot more of the weaker hands. And C betting into him really big, I think it's gonna look really strong to this player. So even if he's sitting there with queen deuce, uh, you know, he's gonna be folding the turn, I, I believe, if, if he's not even folding the flop. So 
really ask yourself, are you playing the right amount of tables or are you just doing what feels easiest, which is often playing too many tables? Number three, telling people about the result before it happens. It is something that I run into and it, it seems like something that wouldn't matter too much. But there's this meme joke that happens around the poker world. It's like when you tweet about a tournament, you bust. And obviously that could be selection bias. It could be any, any kind of cognitive bias, but it's something that I've noticed in myself. I play different and my students play different as soon as they post in the group, hey, I'm on the final few tables. So often they'll just start punting off or you know their friends will start railing them or they have some pressure to win because they've already announced that they're gonna be crushing this tournament. I like to, in general, and this is a strategy I changed over the last few years, I like to, in general, not tell people that I'm running deep, not tell people if I'm playing a bit cash game. Obviously, it's hard if you're streaming, you're doing the absolute opposite of this. But I'd really seriously recommend asking yourself, are you telling people like, oh, I'm final few tables of tournament and then playing super different? Because even if you think you're not, there's a very good chance that you are. I generally would see about smaller in these kind of spots against uh, against recreational players that would be more likely to check raise. I think I'd rather see about bigger because he's still going to be check raising his 10 eights and stuff um, versus two thirds. So that was a mistake there, I think, going, uh, going smaller with the nines. Number four, the wrong thought process. Now, this is something that I will hammer in again and again and again and again because every single student that I find is that, that I haven't been teaching myself is just thinking absolute nonsense. Like for instance here, they'll be thinking, okay, well he's got a range advantage, the queen's good for him perhaps, but maybe I need to go small because he's got that or maybe I need to be checking. And it's like, it's not, it's not like that. Okay, when you're playing 500 zoom, there's a lot of things you need to be juggling. Let's imagine you're playing 10 and 0, which most of you guys are gonna be around that level. You need to be thinking, what is my opponent's range? So maybe some King X, maybe, you know, some Ace X and a bunch of stuff that isn't gonna call much. Maybe maybe some spade hands. Um, and then how much will that call? So that, that's the question. Okay, let's pretend he's got King Jack. How much will he call? Let's pretend he's got King Nine. How much will he call? Let's pretend he's got five, six of, oh, they can't have five, six of spades. We've got the five of spades. Let's pretend, let's pretend he's got Ace, Deuce of spades. How much is he gonna call? And then make an intuitive guess about that. Now, when I'm playing, when I'm playing 500, zoom, 500 zoom, you need to understand a lot more about poker, but you guys don't need to know that we, we have to be polarized here, so we're gonna be you know, overbetting a lot of our hands and checking, checking a huge proportion of our range. You don't need to know that. It's unimportant when you're playing the, the stakes that most of you guys are playing. So the wrong thought process is really, really tripping people up. It's stopping people from being able to be concise. It's stopping people from being able to be precise. What, it, what it's happening is that you're having loads and loads of noise because people have watched, you wanna be checking here most of the time with the kings. Um, it, it smashes his range. Got a be doing some pot control and it's really nice if it goes check check and then you just get to overbet a lot of turns um, with a lot of bluffs and then also a lot of one pair line hands like ace queen plus. Um, not on the 10, the 10 the ten you can't overbet because you can have too much ace 10, jack 10, king 10, etc. Um, so what is, what's been happening is that people have been watching all of these different contents. For instance, they'll be watching mine, they're watching Doug Polk, they're watching Lex Belt House. Again, can't overbet because he can have some flushes. Nah, I'm actually gonna go for the overbet. It's, uh, this, so th this is theoretically, you're not meant to be able to overbet this. I'm going for a merge here. Um, I, I understand why I'm doing it and I'm targeting a lot of his queen X. So he can definitely have some king queens and specifically queen jacks that play like this, maybe some queen eight suitors and even queen seven suited because that's three bit really small pre. Um, and I'm polarizing here to make it seem like I'm, I either have a flush or, or maybe the aces or kings of the, with the heart or nothing. Um, I, I, I definitely don't mind it. I, <laughs> and this is actually a really good point. Like I see my thought process here. I know the thought process that I had. Um, and it's, it's a good thought process. I don't know if it's the best thought process. Uh, you know, you, know, you only have a few seconds to come up with a stratagem, but it's, I know that I was thinking clearly and concisely about my opponent's range and my perceived range. So here's what a, here's what a concise thought process looks like at, at two and L, five and L, 10. And I, re I teach this in my masterclass. I, I really hammer it in. And this is why I think I've had such, so many people have such huge successes. 
when I've been when they've been taking my masterclass, and it's um here's is is here's the secret to poker. What is my opponent's range? And what am I going to do about it? That is it. That is absolutely it. And obviously, the second question is full of so many nuances and intricacies that you need to be considering. It's not easy to say what is my opponent's range and what am I going to do about it. But let's pretend we're at two and L, and you know we can we can even use this example. I think this hand's about to get pretty wild, by the way. Uh, we can even use this hand as an example. Somebody opens, a recreational player opens, he then checks the flop. What's my opponent's range? Well, it's going to be a lot of ace high. Now, what am I going to do about it? Perhaps I'm going to bet the size that ace high is going to call. But not just a size that ace high is going to call, but the biggest size that ace high is going to call. I want to be charging him the most amount of money. Now, that's not that's not his entire range. He can have also have like pocket sixes. He can have maybe some pocket aces or flush draws, but a lot of misses as well. But vast majority of the time, when a, when a recreational player checks in this kind of spot, it's going to be ace high. Um, and checking by the side, he's probably not actually a recreational player, but I can see, see an argument for calling, see an argument for three betting, the six out of tens for fours with the four of spades. Shout out to Hannah. Um, and so, so one of the things that you really have to be asking yourself, just like um, paying attention as well, is when I'm, in, when I'm in a hand, what am I thinking about? Am I thinking about range advantages and balancing and what my actual range is and board textures and all these things? And these, these are all sometimes important phenomena, perhaps not balancing and range advantage when you're at 2 and L or whatever, uh, or even up to 50 and L. But these are things that eventually you're going to have to be thinking about if you want to be an elite player. Get out of there. Get out of there, Charlie. Don't do it. You ain't worth it. And you need to be assessing whether these thoughts are actually helpful, whether they're actually conducive to you. Good double barrel there with the 8 9. Um, whether they're actually conducive to you making money in poker or whether they're actually taking away from the EV that you're, that you're creating. So think about it again. What is my opponent's range? And at every point in every hand, post flop especially, you need to be thinking, what is my opponent's range? If you don't have an understanding of what your opponent's range is, you're, you're screwed. There's nothing you can do. And you'd be amazed how many of you guys listening to me do not have an idea of that intuitively or even intellectually. Like you need to know when somebody check calls this flop that they have queen x, nine x, five x, one half, one heart hand and maybe some traps and then maybe some straight draws as well. You know, because if you see that's more, you can have some like King Jacks and stuff, there's no harm. You need to know that. You need to be able to just reel that off. And I ask my students when we're in game, not in game, but when we're in sessions watching their games, what is what is your opponent's range here? And more often than not, they're floundering. They're floundering for, for answers and they don't get the right answer. You know, they're, they're floundering to think of, okay, or well, maybe it has this, maybe it doesn't have that. And it's just like, if you don't know that off the top of your head, how are you making that snap decision on the river to, to raise the, the raise the river? Or how are you making the snap decision to call that? Was it intellectual? Was it a rational decision? Or was it more of an emotional decision because you just felt like you wanted to win the hand? And it's something that I guarantee a lot of people listening to my voice right now think that they're really good at. But damn it, big stick, always have. Gave him too much credit to have bluffs there, I think. They think that they they know what they're thinking. They think that they know that they're having a good and concise thought process. Um, one, one of the issues here, by the way, is that because we see that small, our range looks really weak. Because if we had aces, for instance, this guy might expect us to go big against this recreational player. So you have to you have to be really honest with yourself. Do you always know what your opponent's range is, and you are you always considering a plan? And this is something the feedback that I actually get a lot of the time when I'm streaming, when I'm playing poker, is that I make poker seem really simple. You know, obviously I'll do a lot of very creative things. Obviously I'll play very differently to pretty much every single other high stakes professional. It seems to work. I, you know, I'm beating some of the, the toughest games in the world. Um, but it still sounds really simple. And that's because I'm just, all I'm doing is I'm going through my opponent's range and then I'm making a plan. You know, and that, that plan making isn't the simplest thing to do in the world. You need to have played millions of poker hands to be able to make that plan. Uh, opening ace a here into what I thought was two recreational players in the blinds, but now in hindsight, I think there might be no recreational players in the blinds. <laughs> Always gotta be careful of your layman. 
Um, so you, you, you know, making the plan is very hard and that takes millions of hands of practice. And it's something that isn't going to come easily to most people, but you just have to be doing it. You have to be even after a session, pausing a hand and saying, okay, what did I think meditating there? Very nice job. Nice and uh, looking nice and holy. Uh, you have to be thinking, okay, what, what did I think my opponent's range was at this point and why did I make this decision? You have to be brutally honest with yourself because most people are not being honest with themselves and they'll be playing even up to the mid stakes and they just won't have a solid thought process. I watch streamers playing high stakes and their thoughts are just all over the place. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to name names here, but their thought processes are just not good for what they're trying to achieve, which is playing poker. The thought processes might sound good because they're talking about blockers and they're talking about balancing and they're talking about frequencies and range advantages and things like that. But it just isn't looking at the whole picture of the hands. They're focusing in on one or two phenomena, one or two factors, and it's, it's just resulting in a you know, really subpar game. So number five and the fifth and final thing that I'm going to be speaking about, about why people are failing at poker. Uh, the five things that you can do to improve your poker game if you're, if you're not doing them already is that people spend time studying the wrong things uh, you can you can raise here against against most people obviously it's very dry board you can actually still have some bluffs you know some backdoor maybe like five six of clubs maybe some like um, jack ten of diamonds if you want to turn those kind of hands into a bluff as well um, nice little over bit wasn't it was it over bit and so if you're, how you study, ask yourself this, how am I studying poker? What, what is the main thing that you're, you're putting time into there, um, you know, time into to study poker? Are you playing loads? Are you watching loads of different people's streams? Are you watching loads of different people's uh, YouTube content? Because I guarantee if you're playing 25 and L and you're watching somebody like Jarrett Man, who by the way is a phenomenal 500 Zoom player, you can go check out his channel. Um, I, think, uh, I think just put Jarrett Man Poker into YouTube, you'll find him. Um, but if you're playing 25 to nothing and you're watching Jarrett Man, you're going to be melting your brain. And here's what I think you should be doing. If you want to be playing 25 now, watch other people who are very good at poker play 25 and out. Uh, because if you, if they're playing 500 now, if you're watching me play 500 Zoom and you're thinking this is good preparation for you playing, playing 25 and out, you're, you're out of your mind. It's, it's a, such a different game. The thought processes involved are so drastically and vastly different. Come on, chips and crisps, put it in, put it in, boy. It's, it's, not, it's not worth your time. It's not worth your time to put down the chips and crisps. Fucking <laughs> um, So here's what I would do. I'd watch that, and that's why I did the, the bankroll challenge. And also, I would, I would spend time finding people who are on a similar wavelength and a similar level to you in poker and speak strategy over and over and over again and if you're not if you're not speaking strategy with people then you're not practicing your thought processes and honing your thought processes outside of the game and this is actually why i've started back up my my discord which I, i'm actually spending time in myself as well so people who are like-minded and want to speak strategy in, in, a, in a very productive way can and um and people are sharing lots of tips already so I, I'll, I'll leave the link of my discord in in my in the, in the description below uh, let me know what you thought of this kind of this kind of uh this kind of content it's definitely different i have so many things i want to be speaking about but i am very conscious of how it can actually get a bit dry sometimes if somebody's speaking without the without any poker happening so let me know if this was good for you do check out my discords and I'll see you next time, guys. Much love.